Some 20 years ago, I had landed a great job and had moved to a new city. A few blocks from my apartment was an old hole in the wall where I'd drink on Saturdays. It was right next door to a strip club that the Angel still operated, so it had all kinds of human traffic. It was here that I became acquainted with the most interesting fella, and after becoming a regular at that establishment, he would tell me tales from his life while drinking straight whiskey like it was water. He was born in Yugoslavia. His mother was Slovenian, his father Croatian. Brought up under the Marxist regime of Marshal Tito, he had little to say about his childhood, but that it was normal and not unpleasant. He schooled in Zagreb and finally became a master of Slavic languages, eventually gaining fluency in seven. In the early 1990s, when Yugoslavia broke up during the period of European decommunization, he began working for the UN as a translator in Sarajevo, then Belgrade. At this point, the Yugoslavian wars began, where he had to take a part. His foremost task was translating for UN peacekeepers where ethnic conflict was fiercest. And, during the Bosnian War, he had the following experience. It was late 1995, and the war was winding down. Mercenary Russian chopper pilots, all of them veterans of Afghanistan, and always stinking of vodka and head cheese, ferried UN peacekeepers and militia in and out of the last remaining hotspots. One morning, their chopper landed near the town of Prozor. The company of men included two UN representatives, some Croatians, and a handful of others. The Croatian commander had a heated argument with the UN representatives, then left the landing site with his men. The reps told our translator to remain in the chopper or he would lose his position. So, of course, he immediately disobeyed the order, grabbed his equipment and took off after his countrymen. A few miles away, in an open field surrounded by forest, were a Bosniak Muslim man and his two teenage sons. They were held at gunpoint by local militia, standing together, beaten up somewhat, with the two sons tied with their backs against each other, with the rope allowing for some slack. The commander informed my acquaintance that these men, three years earlier, had slain all of the Christian inhabitants on their street at the outbreak of the war. They had peacefully lived as neighbors for over a decade prior, but one morning this all changed, when these men had gone door to door with Kalashnikovs, murdering everyone. They then took all of the usable possessions from the slain victims and hoarded these up in their home. The commander had gathered eyewitness accounts from dozens of locals, and the militia had passed sentence on the culprits. Their punishment was as follows. The father was held so that he looked upon the center of the field. There his sons were brought, doused in gasoline, then lit on fire. While they moved in wide circles, being tied to one another, the flames encompassed them so that they became like two separate balls of fire, their motion being linked by the bonds of the rope. My acquaintance was later told that this was a very old traditional punishment given to criminals who committed atrocities as a pair, and that it was called the dancing couple. The two young men eventually succumbed and lay on the ground. The commander went up to the sobbing father and simply stated, You counseled your sons to commit murder, even though you were their father. And, God willing, their dead bodies shall be the last thing you will ever see. And with that, he took an acetylene torch, opened the blast trigger, and burned out the man's eyes. Afterwards, everyone went their separate ways, and my acquaintance eventually came to North America, leaving behind his war-ravaged homeland. For myself, the punishment fit the crime, and when I asked him what he thought about this, he simply shook his head, stating, What is the point? If they were guilty, then shoot them and be finished with it. The problem with my people, he continued, is that they are still too romantic to know the difference between proper justice and a punishment. But that is also the very reason why we will still be around, when yours will only be a distant memory. And thereafter I sat for a long time, pondering this.